Hey everyone, I love D&D &D and 5th edition is my favorite edition so far, but it's not perfect and I think most of us agree a couple adjustments could make things even better. Uh, I'm doing a series of those adjustments that I'm providing. Uh, now if you want to access them, you can do so. There is a document in the video description uh, and then that document is going to have a link back to this video. Uh, and in these videos I'm going to explain what adjustments I made and why I made them. So this week what I want to do is I want to talk about the Druid. So the Druid is a strange class and I don't think it's an overly popular class either from uh, things I've read and I understand why. Uh, although the Druid is an interesting class, there's just some weird stuff there. Uh, Moon Druid, I've talked about before, I think has some weird things going on with the power curve. At level 1 they do fine and then uh, at second level they go into the stratosphere, right? When you can turn into a bear uh, with 34 hit points uh, and the fighter beside you has half that much and then as a bonus action you can go right back to 34 hit points again and then after a short rest you can do it all over again. Never mind the fact that you're attacking twice, they're attacking once. Things go out of control. Uh, and then what happens is that uh, the scaling on the wild shape isn't good. So uh, you have this amazing ability at level 2 and then, you know, by level 8 or 9, it's not so great anymore. In fact, at level 8, you know, your wild shape really isn't much better than it was at level 2. Uh, and you're not increasing the number of times you can use it or anything. Uh, so what ends up happening is you got this situation where the Moon Druid turns into this super fighter at level 2. And then they have to kind of transition into spell casting later because wild shape just doesn't keep up. Uh, and then with other kinds of druids, wild shape is basically just a utility. I've seen druids try to use uh, wild shape in combat and it does not turn out well. The, the creatures they take uh, just aren't powerful enough. They don't have enough hit points. Their armor class isn't good enough. Uh, and they, they just end up losing that shape right away. And sometimes they take more damage uh, just from the carryover damage than they would normally be taking with their druid. Uh, and Unfortunately, uh, yeah, if you're playing a druid that's more of a casting type, like the land druid, uh, then what you kind of feel like is a uh, subpar wizard. Uh, your spell list isn't as good, uh, and you're not getting those fantastic level 2 abilities like Portent or Enchanting Gaze. Instead, you're getting a utility, uh, which is the wild shape, which is fine, uh, but it's not uh, up to those levels. Uh, so, so the land druid just falls behind uh, what wizards can do and they're not really getting much uh, instead of that. So my goal uh, as I tackled the druid was to take a look at wild shape and I wanted it to scale better. I want a moon druid to be able to take wild sh shape at level 2, contribute to combat in wild shape, but I don't want them to overshadow everyone else. But what I also want to happen is a moon druid at higher levels to be able to still wild shape and be effective. Uh, but the problem is, if you do that and they're a full caster on top of that, uh, then things get out of hand. So uh, what I wanted to do is maybe have a resource cost of some spell casting to improve the wild shape. Uh, so that was kind of the route I took there. Uh, and with the land druid, what I wanted to do is mainly I wanted to make wild shape effective for land druids, less effective than a moon druid, of course, because it's not their specialty. Uh, but I wanted to give them something unique they could do with wild shape. Uh, and then I wanted to give them some other abilities that I thought enhanced the idea of a druid. And maybe the moon druid's more a master of beasts, and maybe uh, a land druid is more like beasts and plants. Uh, so, uh, yeah, those are the kinds of changes I went for with the Treatment Monk variant, so let's get started. So this is the Druid, the Treatment Monk variant, uh, and we begin with just with our class chart. Uh, and then when we get into class features, not a lot changes. Uh, hit points are going to remain the same, proficiencies are going to remain the same. Now, I considered, some people have mentioned to me that they get frustrated with the uh, restriction on druid armor, they can't wear any metal armor. The idea is that maybe it's antiquated and doesn't belong on modern druids. Um, and yeah, it is antiquated and uh, very traditional. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Uh, and when I look at druids, I think I can see why it's in there. I think there's balance reasons to 
put it in there as well as tradition reasons. Uh, so I'm going to keep it the same. Remember, you can always uh, have some options like dragon scale armor, that kind of thing, to get around it. Uh, but I do think it provides a little bit of flavor to the class, and I think it's kind of important to the balance. So I kept it the same. Your starting equipment is going to remain the same. Uh, still speak druidic. Your spell casting is unchanged from the player's handbook in every case. Uh, but what I did do, as I mentioned in the introduction, is I made a major change to Wild Shape. Uh, so it's going to start out the same. So at second level, you can use your action to magically assume the form of a beast you've seen before. You can use this feature twice. You regain the expended uses when you finish a short or long rest. Your druid level determines the beast you can tr transform into, as shown on the wild shape table. At second level, for example, you can transform into any beast that has a challenge rating of one quarter or lower that doesn't have a flying or swimming speed. But here's the first change. When you use your wild shape to take the form of a creature CR1 or higher, you must expend an available spell slot, depending on the CR of the form taken. The spell slot expended must be of equal or greater than the CR of the form taken. For example, a 14th level druid uses Wild Shape to take the form of a giant scorpion. Since the giant scorpion has a CR of 3, the druid must expand a spell slot of 3 or greater to take the form. You can stay in Wild Shape for a number of hours equal to your, half your druid level. You revert to your normal form unless you expand another use of this feature. You can revert to your normal form earlier by using a bonus action on your turn, and you automatically revert if you fall unconscious, drop to 0 hit points, or you die. Uh, so now the wild shape table just got majorly revised. Uh, so it is going to be very different from what you see in the player's handbook. Uh, at second level, it's the same. Uh, you're going to have max CR one quarter, no flying or swimming speed, example wolf. Um, and then at fifth level, you'll be able to take half challenge rating creatures, no flying speed, like a crocodile. At seventh level, so this is a level earlier, uh, you can take max CR1 creatures, but no flying speed, like the lion. Then at ninth level, you'll be able to take challenge rating 2 creatures. Now, normally, druids weren't able to go above challenge rating 1 unless they were a moon druid. Uh, that's no longer the case. Now, all druids will be able to get into higher challenge rating creatures. Uh, they're going to be able to select a flying speed uh, by level 9. That's actually a level later than in the player's handbook. Uh, and then it goes to 3 at 11th, 4 at 13th, 5 at 15th, 6 at 17th, and 7 at 19th. Now, even a Moon Druid in the Player's Handbook could never get into Challenge Rating 7. Uh, this is going to be new, and all Druids will be able to access it by level 19. Moon Druids will be able to access it even earlier. Uh, so this is a major change to the Wild Shape forms available, uh, but remember as well that if you are doing a challenge rating 1 or higher, you'll be expending a spell slot. But also remember that no matter what level you are, uh, if you choose to use your Wild Shape on the low challenge rating creatures, there's no spell slot expenditure, and that never changes. Now I had a lot of thought into this, determining how I would balance Wild Shapes effectively and there were many models I went through uh, and this is the model that worked the best uh, and I'm going to go through each of these uh, challenge ratings just kind of to show you what you could expect at each level uh, and I'll do that in a separate video so you don't need to watch it here uh, but if you want to see it uh, I'm going to link it in the video description I'll link it in the comment section down below and just to show how the balance works now and I think I'm pretty happy with it. It works quite well, uh, right from 2nd level through 19th level. Uh, Moon Druid, I think, is going to be effective as a Wild Shape combatant throughout their entire career. Uh, and I think other Druids can choose to do Wild Shape and go into combat, and they'll be able to do so in a way that's still effective. Uh, it'll be significantly less effective than a Moon Druid, uh, but in some ways unique, and uh, we'll be going through that in a bit as well. Uh, so. I am very happy with the way this has turned out. It's, of course, a major departure from the player's handbook, but I just want you to know this was not done lightly. I did a lot of thinking, and I did a lot of looking at what kind of uh, power levels each of these would bring and how that would compare to the rest of the party at those levels. Uh, and I think it's worked out reasonably well. And remember, because we're expending spell slots on these, these higher challenge rating forms 
are going to be very limited in the amount of times you can access them in a day uh, because you don't have a lot of level six and higher spell slots. Now, the rules for what happens when you're in Wild Shape are completely unchanged. Uh, so I'm not going to go through them all here. Uh, just know they're, they're the same as they are in the Player's Handbook. Also at second level, we'll be selecting a Druid Circle. And in this one, we're going to go through the Circle of the Land and the Circle of the Moon. Of course, there are other Druid subclasses in Xanathar's and in Eberron and other sources. Uh, so I won't be dealing with those right now, but I will be looking at them, of course, if I move on beyond the Player's Handbook. Uh, ability score improvements remain the same. Now, Timeless Body, I kept the same, even though it's a pretty pointless ability. Uh, you age more slowly, uh, which doesn't come up in gameplay very often. Uh, so, I decided to keep this the same because I made such a change to Wild Shape, and I enhanced the subclasses significantly as well. Uh, so, despite the fact that that's not a powerful ability, it's just a flavor ability, uh, so I just kept it the same. Wild Shape spells, I also kept the same. So, this gives you the ability to use your Wild Shape, and you can cast a number of spells while in Wild Shape, uh, which normally you can't do. Uh, that's a big boost for Moon Druids normally. It becomes a big boost for all Druids now, because all Druids will be able to access more significant Wild Shapes. Uh, and then we get into Arch Druid. Now, Arch Druid was one of those capstones that was strange because if you were a Moon Druid, it was completely broken. It would allow you to use your bonus action every round to give yourself well over 100 hit points in healing uh, forever with no limitation. And then if you were not a Moon Druid, it just gave you an ability to use a utility ability a little bit more. Uh, so it was incredibly unbalanced between the subclasses uh, and incredibly unbalanced towards the other classes as well. Uh, so what I've done now is uh, I've actually kept it the same technically. Uh, so at 20th level, you have unlimited uses of your Wild Shape, but I've included the spell slot expenditure doesn't go away. So you still have to expend the spell slot to become whatever Wild Shape you want. Now that means you can technically become unlimited challenge rating one quarter or unlimited challenge rating one half creatures, but there will be some limitation on the higher challenge rating creatures depending on how many spell slots you use up. Uh, so this creates, I think, a very important limitation on this so that you can't just constantly change into a challenge rating 7 creature every round and get yourself 150 some hit points every round. Uh, instead, you can do that a couple times, but your 7th level spell slots, your 6th level spell slots, at that level you're going to have a couple of those each. Uh, so it does create a pretty important limitation, I think, to that, but I still think it's very, very powerful. Uh, additionally, you can ignore the verbal and somatic components of your druid spells as well as any material components, so those spells that you couldn't cast with wild shape spells, now you can. Uh, so I think this is still an incredibly powerful ability, but it's not just powerful for moon druids anymore. Now it's going to be powerful for all druids. Uh, and moon druids might still benefit a little bit more than other druids because they can enhance their wild shape. Uh, in ways that other druids can't. But other druids are going to get a significant boost here, and there has been technically a limitation on moon druids here. And I'm pretty happy with how it ended up without making any major revisions to the capstone. Uh, so let's get into our subclasses. Uh, the first subclass I'm going to talk about is Circle of the Land. So Circle of the Land, of course, was basically like the druid version of a wizard before, except they didn't get some of the special abilities that wizards got. They had a inferior spell list to what wizards got. Uh, their spellcasting were closer to a cleric, and uh, they, they have special abilities they got with Circle of the Land that weren't spellcasting based, I thought, were pretty lackluster. So I wanted to make some pretty significant changes here, and I did. Uh, bonus cantrip remains the same, uh, but the first major change is plant wild shape. This is something that's going to be unique for the land druid, and it's going to give their wild shape just a flavor that no other uh, druid gets. So when they use their wild shape feature, they may choose a creature of the plant subtype uh, that you've seen before 
of appropriate channel training. Now, there's a limited number of creatures that are plant creatures. Uh, so this isn't a lot of different creatures, but there are some neat ideas here. Uh, if you look at Challenge Rating 5, for example, and you won't be able to access that till high level, uh, but you can become a Shambling Mound. And, of course, you can concentrate on a Druid spell at that time, so you could have a Call Lightning going at the same time as being a Shambling Mound. Shambling Mounds heal when they take Lightning damage. Uh, so there are some definite options for some interesting ideas with Plant Wild Shape. Natural Recovery is basically the Land Druid version of Arcane Recovery, and it's going to remain the same. Uh, the Circle spells actually will all remain the same. You can have the same options, the same spells. Uh, then we're going to go into Nature Stride. This one has changed. Starting at 6th level, you gain the ability to move as if you were a creature of the wild. You gain a climb and swim speed equal to your walking speed. You also gain a burrow speed of 5 feet. So I wanted to give them... It's something that just didn't make them feel like a ranger, but made them feel more like a druid. Uh, and I think that did that. That brings us to Nature's Bond at 6th level. Uh, so at level 6, you gain the ability to bond with a willing tiny beast that is CR1 or lower, forming a magic telepathic bond with that willing companion. While your bonded creature is within 100 feet of you, you can communicate with it telepathically. Additionally, as an action, you can see through its eyes and hear what it hears until the start of your next turn gaining the benefits of any special senses that the bonded creature has. During this time, you are deaf and blind with regard to your own senses. You may only share this bond with one beast at a time. So this is a little bit like the druid version of Find Familiar, except instead of it being a spirit, it's the actual creature is going to be your familiar. Uh, this is similar to what you can do in the Monster Manual. There are certain creatures that might choose to become your familiar, and then you gain uh, telepathic communication with them, ability to share senses with them. Uh, this is uh, more like that, in that we're not binding a spirit with a spell. Uh, we are actually just making friends with a creature and then forming a bond with that creature. Uh, then we get at level 10, Nature's Ward, starting at 10th level. When you cast a Druid spell that deals damage, you may add your Wisdom modifier to the damage once. Uh, so we're just going to improve the spell casting a little bit more for the Land Druid. Uh, then we get to Nature's Sanctuary. Uh, this is similar to the Nature's Sanctuary ability of the Land Druid, but I've enhanced it a bit. When you reach 14th level, creatures of the natural world, sense your connection to nature, become hesitant to attack you. When a beast or plant creature attacks you, the attack is made with disadvantage, and that creature must make a wisdom saving throw against your druid spell save DC. On a failed save, the attack automatically misses, and the creature is charmed by you until a remove curse spell is cast on it, or until one hour has passed. On a successful save, the creature is immune to this effect for 24 hours. The creature is aware of this effect before it makes the attack against you. So that brings us to Living Greenery. Living Greenery is an entirely unique ability uh, for the uh, land druid that didn't exist at all before. So, when you reach 14th level, your mastery of spells that create plants becomes unmatched. When you cast a spell that has a duration of one minute or longer, that requires your concentration and creates plants, such as Entangle and Grasping Vine, uh, you can use your action to move the plants created by the spell up to 30 feet along the ground in a direction of your choice to an area that you can see as long as you concentrate on the spell. Additionally, you can cast spells as though you were in the space of a plant you created with a spell, but you must use your own senses. Uh, so there's two things here. Uh, the first thing is when you cast a plant spell, uh, as long as it's one minute or longer and it uses your concentration and it creates plants, uh, then you can use your action to move that spell effect. Uh, so you did your entangle, and now you want to move your entangle. You can do that without casting the spell again. You just have to use your action. Uh, so that's quite good, especially when you combine it with things like Wall of Thorns, for example, or even Grasping Vine, for example. Uh, and then the second thing we're doing is you can cast spells as though you were in that plant space. Uh, so this is similar uh, to the Trickery Cleric's ability with their duplicate except with this enhancement, it's with spells. So this is going to allow the Land Druid to have spell effects uh, emanate from the plants they create with their spells. Uh, so I think that really fits with the idea that the Land Druid is more of a plant-based Druid, uh, and again, still very magical in its effect. So that brings us to Circle of the Moon. This is our wild-shaped Druid. Most druids you see these days are Circle of the Moon, uh, mainly because Wild Shape is so much better for them, uh, especially at low levels. Of course, we have changed uh, the way that uh, Wild Shape scales. 
Uh, so it's a better ability for non-Circle of the Moon Druids. But I still wanted Circle of the Moon to be the Wild Shape Specialist. So their abilities really are centered around Wild Shape, even more so than they are in the Player's Handbook. Uh, so first we get into the Combat Wild Shape, uh, and this remains almost the same as the Player's Handbook. Uh, you gain the ability to use Wild Shape on your turn as a bonus action, uh, and then you, when you are transformed into Wild Shape, you can use a bonus action to expend a spell slot to regain D10 hit points per level of the spell slot expended. So the only change here I've made is I've changed the die type here. It was a D8, uh, so it's now going to be a D10. And in my experience, the self-healing ability of the Moon Druid could use a small boost, uh, and this is a small boost. Uh, then we get into our circle forms. Uh, so obviously this one needed to change significantly. The rights of your circle grant you the ability to transform into more dangerous animal forms. Starting at second level, you can use your wild shape to transform into a beast with a CR as if you were a druid of two levels higher. The limitations of wild shape by level are not affected by this ability. So let's just go back and see what that means. So when we look at our wild shape chart, at second level, uh, moon druid would be treated as if they're fourth level. Now, we haven't scaled yet at fourth level, so at second level, a Moon Druid is still limited to the one quarter challenge rating creature. The only real enhancement that they have is that they can turn into that form with a bonus action. Of course, that's a pretty significant bonus at that level uh, because you're not using your bonus action for anything else, so you can use it to become the creature and then attack still on your first round. But the Moon Druid's going to scale much quicker uh, because they are going to be able to access this fifth level uh, when they're third level. Uh, and then every single one after this is basically they're going to be one level ahead of all other druids. So while uh, other druids are accessing challenge rating 3, the moon druid will be accessing challenge rating 4, etc. Then we get into Primal Strike. Starting at 6th level, your attacks in beast form count as magical for the purposes of overcoming resistance and immunity to non-magical attacks and damage. That is what it is in the player's handbook. I've added something there. Additionally, when you hit an enemy with a piercing or slashing attack while in Wild Shape, you may expend a spell slot to enhance the attack with poison. Uh, so this is like you, you're going to have venomous attacks. The poison damage added is equal to 1d10 points per level of the spell slot expended. Uh, and you will be able to do this with any attack that basically is going to be cutting the creature, so piercing or slashing attacks. So if you have a bludgeoning attack, you're punching. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense for those to be venomous. Uh, this is more for biting or slashing. So this is going to enhance the damage of your wild shapes significantly if you are willing to expend the spell slots to do so. So that's more again of what I was talking about uh, when I introduced this video is that we can make the choice with a Moon Druid to be more based on spellcasting, or we can make the choice to have our wild shape even better. Uh, but that is going to be a choice that a player is going to be able to make. And if they don't, their wild shape will still be reasonably good, and it's going to scale at a more reasonable rate than it had in the player's handbook. Uh, but if they do, uh, they can choose to become basically a martial character. Uh, if they want to use all their spell slots on just making their wild shapes as good as possible, uh, they can do so, and it's going to give them a boost that's going to bring them in line with other marshals. Uh, so it gives some flexibility to the Moon Druid that they didn't have before. Before, they kind of were forced into Wild Shape at low level, and then they were forced into Spellcasting at higher levels. Now we're going to have that option for Moon Druids. They can go either way, and they can change that on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but it's never going to be a case where their martial abilities are going to outpace the marshals, uh, and it's never going to be a case where their spellcasting abilities are going to outpace the spellcasters. Uh, and I like that balance. Uh, then we get to the elemental wild shape. This one I kept the same. So you can expand both your uses of wild shape at the same time to transform into an air elemental, earth elemental, fire elemental, or water elemental. That's a good form for this uh, level, even with this changed uh, chart, because normally at 10th level, you'd be looking at 12th level on the chart, which means at level 10 you would be doing challenge rating 3 creatures or uh, challenge rating 4 creatures by the time you get to level 11. Uh, so uh, an elemental is challenge rating 5, and they're pretty good for challenge rating 5 as well. So this is a 
still a good ability for the Moon Druid, even though we've changed our wild shape. Uh, and then finally, Deadly Forms. By 14th level, you've learned to use your magic to alter your wild shape forms to be even more deadly in combat. Add your Wisdom modifier to the armor class of your wild shape forms. Uh, wild shape forms tend to have lower armor classes. If you are in melee as a druid using wild shape, uh, the one thing that is always going to lag behind is your armor class, and this is going to bridge that gap to some extent. There's still going to be a lower armor class for your wild shapes than uh, martial classes, but we're going to have it so now that some attacks against you are at least going to miss. So that's the druid. Again, the main thing I changed here is the wild shapes. The wild shapes got a dramatic change from the player's handbook. And again, I did think about that carefully. And if you are concerned about the balance of this, uh, then I encourage you to click the link and look at the video uh, that I'm going to go through these. Uh, and that might alleviate your concerns to some degree. Uh, like I said, this was not done without careful consideration uh, of what it meant at every single level that this occurred. Uh, and I do think it's worked out quite well. Uh, so that is the Druid, uh, the Treant Monk variant. Next week, I'm going to be looking at the Paladin. So I hope you'll come back and join me then. Until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everyone, and I will see you next week.